the golden age of steam when manors and halls, castles and kings ruled the rails. And that is until the 11th of August 1968, when Oliver Cromwell, a Britannia-class locomotive, hauled the last official steam passenger train on British railways. So what happened to all those wonderful locomotives, those giants of steam? Let me take you back to a time when television was black and white and John Humphreys was a young reporter. Like a lopsided cross, the signal marks the graveyard of the steam locomotive. 250 of the great iron corpses lined up for cremation in the furnaces of the scrap metal dealers. The great steam giants that once pounded the rails from Land's End to John O'Groats, rotting and rusting now on tracks of weed and grass. This really is the end of the line. A reawakening of memories here if you ever wanted to be an engine driver. A disappointment if you're a preservationist, because the railway authorities won't allow the engines to be sold to anyone who wants to preserve them. A profit and a long-term contract if you're in the scrap metal business. locomotive undertakers. Almost every week, a new funeral procession. But what happens from here on in? Steam-driven locos gave way to oil-driven diesels. Perhaps the diesel's life will be shorter than its predecessor, as electricity takes over. But still, there's plenty of room left in the graveyard. As you can see, there's even more room in the graveyard today. This is all that's left since all those rusting locomotives have long since gone. Yes, the Dye Woodham Graveyard of Steam story is one story with a very happy ending. Beautiful, gleaming steam locomotive. And there's no doubt that the steam railway preservation movement would not be the success it is today if it wasn't for one man, Di Woodham. But how did it all start? Well, uh, I suppose there was a, a tinge of sadness because uh, uh, they came in, they were all, all complete, you see. Everything was complete, even calling the tenders and, uh, and uh, all the lamps were on them, everything. You know, they were, they were, uh, if anybody had... Uh, had saved all those lamps and memorabilia, they made a fortune. But you didn't. You just didn't do it. But we were 31 years on engines. Uh, I would say you're talking about 35, 36 years ago. And um, uh, how, how many did you buy first of all in that first batch? Well, they were they were sold in batches of up to 20. And I think the first, well, we were the first ones to be allocated. Uh, that's in matter of record, actually. Uh, 
and that was five. We bought five. And at that time, we paid about 1500 2000 pounds each. But we ended up paying 10000 pounds for them you know, towards the end. You know. Inflation and all the rest of it. Did you break any of them up? We brought a lot up, yes. We brought a lot up. They accelerated the, uh, the uh, wagon program, the rolling stock program, and accelerated it. A lot of it, of course, was, was, was rubbish. It was worn out, 40, 50 years old. And some of them were just grease boxes. No wagon bearings or anything like that. Um, and, um, but at that time, we, we were making pallets. So I used all the timber that was any good to make pallets, which meant I was getting the timber for nothing which meant I, I had all the pallets I wanted. And of course you had the ideal place to store them really, didn't you? We stored all over the dock, actually. We couldn't store them all where they were. That's only, that was only a proportion of them. We stored at the, uh, at the top, the high level. We stored at Barry Goods. We stored at the, uh, all the old uh, wagon making yards we stored. Because uh, down there, I think the most we could store down there was about 60. All the rest was stored all over the dock. And, uh, as, as the railways come along and say, we want to lift these sidings, was, uh, I had to move them. And, uh, but we were lucky, we had all this room. And as I say, the researchers both realised in the end that Bally was the key to the preservation movement. The fact that we were able to store the wagons at Bally. And you had locos there from all regions? Oh, everywhere, yeah. 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 Didn't make any difference to the rail, because the, wherever they sold to, they delivered. They, were, they were sold delivered, you see. And uh, they took that into account, of course, when they were considering the tenders, the cost of transport. But as I pointed out earlier, in the early days, I mean, they had no business acumen at all. The railways, I, it was crazy. Some of the locos you had there, the 9F class, for example, I mean, they were barely run in, were they? Well, they were five or six years old ago. Uh, but they were, they were really speaking, those locos were, uh, from a preservationist point of view, were the worst ones of all because it was the older ones which were being serviced all the time and having their um, uh, mandatory uh, uh, overalls. And um, so uh, if you had an engine like, say, 9F, well, they wouldn't service that because they, when the time came, bonk, they just scrapped it. So that the, uh, the older the engine, the more it had, the more it had been serviced. Do you remember the first preservation society to get in touch with you? Dad, Bobby. They were the first, and uh, uh, there's a picture of that engine, or oh, there was a picture in my old office, which Cuno presented to me. How, how did they get in touch with you from Dart Valley then? Did they write, phone, come and see you? Originally, they came and saw me. A fellow, it was a big building firm down there called Staverton. Their managing director came along, and he was a steam buff. And he came along, and um, we dealt with him for, oh, probably 20 years. And they bought quite a lot from us. That really, they bought the manor, as you know, Hinton Manor. And, uh, oh, yes. The, um, but <coughs> it was the old... <coughs> if you look at the steam preservation movement, of course, it, it was sort of um, complemented by the salt of the earth people. The preservation movement at that stage was in its infancy, and they just didn't have the money, did they? Uh, I would think about... There was quite a lot of engines which were sold eventually, uh, which had been preserved about 10 years. Now, the problem was, with so many engines, so many enthusiasts, not enough engines to go wrong, really, is that uh, it became a nightmare. But we had a wonderful man called Francis Drake. Uh, he was a computer expert. He set up his own computer, and he took over. When we formed the Body Rescue, uh, and that was formed in a committee room in the House of Commons, he took over, and he said, now, I'll deal with all the requests for engines. And I used to send me this thing once a month. And you'd have an engine, say, a 9F, if you like, uh, preserve first choice so-and-so, second choice something else, third choice. It was a, it was a complete graph. And, uh, and then we'd, uh, if somebody come along and said, well, we want this engine, I'm saying, sorry, you're fourth in line. So I could turn it up like that. Uh, because it was a long time, 30-odd years. It, it didn't happen overnight, 30-odd years. And uh, uh, he was a marvellous man, he did everything. As well as the preservationists, enthusiasts like myself used to go down there and just look around. Uh, I mean, if you'd have charged a pound each on us to, to look around, you'd have made a fortune. How did you feel about never, so many coming no, busloads? No, I was never my scene. I was never... Uh, I must have managed. 
I mean, I could have gone into estate businesses. If you've got money like I've got money all my life, I could have done all these sorts of things, but money never really bothered me. I was a scrap merchant, and I certainly wouldn't have, uh, had no intention of making money out of the preservationists, because uh, it's not my scene. That doesn't give me any pleasure. As I said earlier, the, it's the, uh, for me, the, what sets the adrenaline is personal satisfaction. I mean, uh, what the hell's the lot of good of money? What good money to me now? I got all the money I'd ever want. Well, how, uh, how did you feel with all these locos standing there? Um, and obviously some unscrupulous characters were coming along and well, taking uh, bits away with them. I had to make the provision to say, well, whatever they take, it doesn't alter the price of the engine. Because uh, basically the majority was taken by the preservationists themselves, trying to get spares and so forth. Or there was something missing off the one that they were buying, but it was on somebody else's engine. So, they, but so it never bothered me. I just said, well, that's it. I never reported any losses to the revenue or anything like that. I simply left the price as it was. And even to this day, they're still, uh, preservationists are still talking to one another and, uh, and sorting out what pieces they got which, <laughs> which they now don't require. Did you have a favourite class? Yes, the Kings. They were definitely the favourite. Certainly if you stand in a cab of, uh, of, uh, of the King, it's, uh, it's a tremendous long view, you know. Well, I have to tell you that my favourite loco from your yard was definitely Duke of Gloucester. Well, the last loco has long since left Barry. And recently you sold some of your railway memorabilia as well. Why was that? Well, you can't put it in the house. It, in a great big office, it doesn't look very big, but you, you can't... They, they put nameplates in here or, uh, or stuff like that, all the plaques, you see. And uh, some of it will go to museums. Yeah. Some, like the Barry, Barry Castle, I think that chap was a, a wonderful enthusiast. Barry Castle, there we go, bid me here please, he'll start me at a thousand again. One thousand on the telephone at one thousand pounds. At one thousand pounds and twelve hundred? At twelve hundred I bid, at twelve hundred, at fourteen hundred? Fourteen hundred I bid, sixteen hundred I bid. Eighteen hundred pounds and two thousand I bid. Yes, yes. Two thousand two hundred, two thousand four hundred. 2,400. I'll take 2,005 if you like. 2,400 pounds then once. 2,500. 2,600. 2,700. 2,800. 2,900. And 3,000 pounds. And 3,100. At 3,100 pounds I'm bid. At 3,100 pounds once. Twice. Last time, Mr. Friedman, £3,100. Mm -hmm. Well, I bought a uh, castle nameplate, and I'm still not quite sure why I bought it, because uh, I'm neither a GWR fan nor a nameplate collector, but it did seem appropriate um, to get a nameplate like that with the name Barry, because it's got such a, a tremendous association with uh, the great rescue of the old engines that would be rather nice to have on the wall. And just to remind me that um, of Barry and, and Woodham Yards, where all these old engines went, and so many were preserved and running today. So that we owe an awful gratitude, a lot of gratitude, I think, to uh, the man who originally brought up these locomotives of scrap, and then allowed uh, enthusiast societies and, and others to buy them and renovate them and put them on British Rail today. The gentleman who bought the Barry Castle nameplate said afterwards that the reason he wanted that was because of its association with Di Woodham and Barry. How do you feel about that? Well, it's very nice, isn't it? You know, it's, uh, it's a compliment. It's, uh, all compliments are nice, I think. Yeah. The, um, <clears throat> of the, I suppose the underlying attraction of uh, the steam, of course, is nostalgia, isn't it? And I, I like to say to people, you know, whatever, whatever some people, of course, are not even interested in who it, but if we, if we think of ducks, if you like ducks, for example, and you live in Scotland, you've got a hell of a long journey down to Slimbridge. And if you live in Cornwall, you've got a hell of a long journey up to Slimbridge, because you like ducks. 
Now, all these people who like steam engines, they're not very far away. Because we've got steam engines in practically every corner of Great Britain. They can get to, they can get to, I mean, I can get to Forrester Dean, I can get to Broadway, I can, I can get to Big Pit. Uh, I mean, uh, you, can, you can get to an engine. And I think that, uh, that in years to come, when the school teachers or whatever they are, take the kids, bus trips or whatever, to, uh, to see these great engines, now they're going to be a sense of wonder to the new generation, aren't they? They look at the great steam engine, out, out sense of wonder. And, uh, and I think that uh, that uh, would be worthwhile. Looking back and reminiscing as we are today, is there anything you regret, something you'd have done differently? Well, I think that you had to have a lot of guts to, to, to if you would have known what you were in for, uh, to, to have done that. You had a lot of guts. And uh, I would think that probably... I doubt whether I would have taken it on. It was a, it was a hard job, very hard job. Uh, you, had, you, had, uh, you, had, you had tragedy, uh, you had uh, romance, you had pathos, you had all sorts of emotions uh, with people that I was dealing with, dealing with engines. Some of these people, when they'd finally collected the money to buy a loco from you, I mean, they must have been quite emotional. Absolutely, yeah. I got oodles of pictures of them presenting the cheque and, and so forth and uh, um, but the emotions of which were which were conjured up with all these people and as i say uh, broken marriages people mortgaging their houses to, to buy engines you know what i mean uh, i imagine some of their wives uh, had to be heroines you know but it was all there it's all there it's all there what were the highlights for you well there's so many you can't really spotlight anyone, can you? Not really. I mean, uh, uh, I mean what a wonderful company the Seven Valley is. Just that. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is that uh, the the plus, as far as I'm concerned, was that uh, uh, which is my my nature. I met all the salt of the earth, and the majority of them working men. It's difficult to imagine that what we've just seen was once a rusting hulk in Barry. Very difficult indeed. I'm sure many people seeing this uh, on the screens in front of them will, will well imagine how on earth could have transformed locomotives and tenders such as these into superbly polished, painted, mechanically perfect machines running along a, a main railway line. But that, in fact, is the case. And I don't think it's stretching uh, imagination too far to say that the foundation stone of the railway preservation movement in Britain owes a great deal to the locomotives which came from Die Woodham's yard. In their original condition, obviously rusty, in many cases decaying, but with all the effort the society's put into it, they've restored them to immaculate condition. Uh, many of them already restored, operating lines, preserved lines throughout Britain. Many more, I suspect, between now and the end of the decade, will see service again. And don't forget that although you have um, some of the spectacular locomotives, the very large mainline locomotives, the majority of the societies depend far more on a bread and butter locomotive, much more modest in size, such as these. They're cheaper to run, easier to maintain, and of course easier to put back in, into sort of good preserved order. So that part of the story, 
maybe many people appreciate it, but I think it should be recorded as well. The, the, the gratitude, not only of the people in the societies, but those who enjoy a little run of two, three, four miles down the local uh, preserved railway track. They'll all benefit from it. What sort of man was he to deal with then? I think I have to say, quite unequivocally, a very fair man indeed. When you think that, as with any commodity, whether it's oil or corn, timber, anything like that, the price fluctuates over a period of years. Inevitably, that's the law of the market. So it is with metal, iron, steel, brass, copper, all the metals you find in locomotives such as these. But once I had agreed a price with a society, or a group, or an individual, whatever the case, he would adhere to that price, and it might be, it might be a week, a month, it might be five years later when the group came up with the money to actually pay and take delivery of the locomotive, Dai would stick to the agreement, whatever had happened to the price in between. And it must be quite honest, there are not all that many people in the world of business who would have adhered to an original bargain without any other conditions like that. So all those groups, many of them, would not be aware of that as a whole. So again, another point which I think should be appreciated far and wide, how fair he was in all his business dealings. As far as the graveyard of steam story is concerned, the wheel has quite literally come full circle, with the possibility of some of the locomotives returning here. Seven years ago, we realized that of all the locomotives that had come through this yard, none had really been saved for Wales. And so, with the aid of a, a grant from the National Heritage Memorial Fund, we acquired ten which represented the sorts that had operated in Wales. There were only 30 locos left at that time, but we got them off, we took them to Cardiff. They were going to be operated in the heart of Cardiff Bay, but regrettably our plans for Cardiff Bay conflict with the, uh, the regeneration strategy. And uh, purely one of those I ironic things, at the beginning of this year, we were requested or asked by, um, Card uh, by the Vale of Glamorgan Borough Council and the Barry Action Partnership to come back here. So in the next few weeks, these 10 locomotives are going to be loaded up on a low loader trundle through the streets of South Cardiff and Barry, and are going to come back to Barry. It's going to be the most exciting project. We see that train going by over there, and hopefully in the future we'll see our little steam train going by, our locomotive from Mountain Ash Colliery, pulling a few carriages from Barry Dock to Barry Island Station. You realize they're all mad. <laughs> they must be all mad. Uh, but I think of them as the salt of the earth. I think of them. I think it's the very, very preservation is the salt of the earth. And if you've been, and obviously you have, uh, what they created was magic. That's what these people created, magic. <laughs>